welcome to our worship tonight at Chartridge. Uh, it's good to be together again on this cold evening. Now, my grandfather would have said on a night, uh, day like this, uh, weather like this, oh, it's like November. <laughs> and my mum would say, it is November. <laughs> but it's good to be together in fellowship, in warm fellowship, with all the blessings we enjoy, isn't it? Uh, just to be together, a privilege that so many of our brothers and sisters don't have. <laughs> Just a few words from Isaiah that have a, a bearing on our reading tonight. Well-known words from Isaiah chapter 40, but we'll start at verse 3 and just, uh, just reading the paragraph to verse 5. The voice of the Lord calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted and every mountain shall be brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight, and the rough places smooth. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh will see together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Matthew chapter 3. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is, is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now John himself was clothed in camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locust and wild honey. Then Jerusalem, or Judea, and all the region around the Jordan went out to him. And they were baptised by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance. For do not think to say to yourselves, we, are, we have Abraham as our father. For I say to you, God is able to raise up the children of Abraham from these stones. And even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which does not bear good fruit will be cut down and thrown in the fire. Indeed, I baptise you with water uh, with, unto repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptise you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His widow and fan is in his hands, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. So we're looking at uh, Matthew chapter 3. Uh, our brother Tony recently uh, reminded us or challenged us that we uh, very often go back to the same passages time and time again, and uh, there are large areas of the Bible that we, uh, we, we rarely preach from. Uh, and... Uh, I do actually usually try to go to a different passage every time, uh, even if I get the same message out of it. But uh, uh, anyway, this week I've uh, gone to one of the most familiar passages in the Bible. It's also just read a short bit, so I'm not heeding the advice of the elders at all. <laughs> but uh, uh, what happened was this. It wasn't a passage that was on my mind, uh, but... My, uh, or one I was thinking about uh, using today at all. But Monday, as I was thinking over Graham's message of last week, and uh, particularly the sense of esteem, of uh, pointing towards Jesus, the whole emphasis of the service, I think, was to point towards Jesus uh, and to esteem him. And uh, the thought uh, just came to me, the one person in the Bible, the character that did that in a very obvious way, was John the Baptist. So I went to this uh, passage, and it's been a very uncomfortable read, really. Uh, 
but I thought I'd share it with you. I, um, I think it's helpful for thinking about ministry in our time, uh, however familiar it is. Because the thing it really said to me, um, yes, it, it's a great passage in the way that it heralds the coming Messiah, uh, you know, our King and our Lord. It's an exciting, urgent passage in that sense. Uh, and it's um, encouraging in that sense. But what it said to me this time is, well, this is what it's going to mean. Yes, it's pointing towards Jesus, but this is what it's going to mean for you. Uh, so I've gone, gone back through this, uh, this passage. Um, it's, it is a challenging passage. It's quite interesting. Um, I think it, it used to be, certainly be on the, uh, the lectionary for the likes of the Anglican and the Methodist Church for, uh, for um, Advent. I think it's probably about the first or the second Sunday. No, certainly the subject of John the Baptist was one that, uh, that was always uh, taken and pro approached. Uh, and, uh, you know, I wonder this year... <laughs> I mean, you can imagine John the Baptist addre addressing the Anglican Synod. <laughs> but for any of us, even if we think we're in a place of uh, you know, obedience, unless um, I think any of us in this country, it, I found every verse challenging. Uh, to the point, I mean, it's uncompromising and it can, some are even disturbing. But there's great encouragement in it as well. Uh, just uh, the context, perhaps, as I'm sure you're familiar with. Matthew, in his first two, two chapters, introduces the Messiah in the sense of uh, to, speaking of Jesus' birth and his genealogy and uh, the background to the, uh, his background. And then in uh, chapter 3, he jumps straight to his ministry. We jump 30 years. And rather abruptly, it starts with, in these days... Uh, you know, suddenly we're launched into, with urgency, with immediacy, into the, the ministry of Jesus. The Messiah, the Messianic Kingdom, is about to begin. I'd actually want to begin in uh, verse 4, and we'll work back. But uh, first point is this. Uh, I've if I've got a title tonight, it's something like a ministry in the wilderness or perhaps the prophet, prophet in the wilderness. And the first point is this, prophet in the wilderness leads a simple lifestyle. John the Baptist had a, a simple, a distinct, also distinctive, but a simple lifestyle. Now, in everything that God does, there is a vastness and a depth that goes into affinity. But there's also a lovely simplicity. Just look at the Lord's Prayer, look at the Ten Commandments. And everything uh, from the wonder of creation through to the gospel of salvation is available to all, regardless of anything like mental capacity or financial means or anything. There's a wonderful simplicity to it. The devil, on the other hand, walks everything. He is a liar, a deceiver. Everything is, he does is, with truth is to twist it, to complicate it, and to turn it into strange directions. And the fallen human mind follows that course if we're not careful. Because even it happens to believers, you know, very often you find a... You know, believers can justify things they know are, com are quite wrong or morally wrong. But somehow for them, their circumstances are different. There is this, this factor and that factor and that factor. So therefore, I can do this, although it's clearly wrong. That can happen to all of us. Somehow our, our minds get turned to what is complicated. And that happens, I think, within ministry. Uh, if we're not careful, we make it very complicated. Wherever, wherever there's been revival, there is a call back to simplicity. Uh, the nonconformists, uh, 
you know, had a simple lifestyle. Of course, many of them were poor and had a little choice. But the ethos was very much that you can, if you live simply, then you free up a load of time and resources for the kingdom of God. The Puritans uh, spent hours in their worship services going into great depth in the word. And their writings have been a great encouragement and stimulation to many, many great speakers and leaders down the ages. Even somebody in their own time, like Martin Lloyd-Jones, would testify to that. You know, they had the, the ability to focus on the things of God. And others have done it, obviously, in practical action. And uh, John Wesley always called his followers to do the same. You know, you can earn as much as you like, but you save and live as simply as you like, so you focus your resources, your money on the kingdom. Uh, you certainly don't engage in pointless hedonistic uh, activity. And uh, in our world, of course, that is where the absolute focus is. Um, I think in certainly most American states, the highest paid uh, earners are baseball and uh, American football coaches. Completely pointless activity. And yet huge amounts of effort and wealth are focused there when a lot of even their own citizens live in squalor and poverty and hunger, let alone the needs of the world. That's the, the way that human nature gets distorted and it can sometimes help us, happen to us in ministry that we overcomplicate it. Now, I'm not in a position to, uh, <laughs> to speak to anyone. My, my commitments are many. Uh, I haven't chosen it that way, but uh, um, you know, I trust that it's what the Lord has for me. But uh, you know, as we, we look at the way our world's going and ministry is going in this country, maybe we need to look again at John the Baptist and his lifestyle and think about you know, living simply and a simple ministry. You know, the commission Jesus gave us is very simple. Uh, go into all the world and preach the gospel. To which I'm sure we instantly say, well, how do I preach the gospel? That's complicated. In a way, it's not. <laughs> simple lifestyle. Prophet in the wilderness has a simple lifestyle. Second... Uh, Issue, uh, second point, we go back to uh, Isaiah's prophecy in verse 3. Uh, the title really ought to be um, Prophet in the Wilderness Prepares the Way for, for the Coming King, uh, which is perhaps the, the normal thing I would get out of it. This time I've moved on to uh, Prophet in the Wilderness Calls Us to Hard Work. The, uh, the picture there is one very much of the herald proclaiming a coming king and saying, make way, get, get the, the route ready, you know, prepare the road, the king is coming, you know, get ready, prepare the way. Preparing the way of the Lord, a beautiful picture, picture of great hope, wonderful privilege. But road building is hard work, it certainly was then. Of course, the Romans were renowned for their straight roads that they built right across their empire so they could move their, their troops quickly to anywhere, to the outskirts of the empire. Uh, but they had an ample supply of slaves to do it. Whatever area of ministry we're involved in, however we're seeking to prepare the way for the Lord, it will be hard. Now, if your ministry's prayer... You know, whether you pray for, praying for worldwide revival or whether you're just praying for one loved one to come to faith, it will be hard. There's a spiritual battle going on. If you minister service, practical service, it may be very rewarding at times, but it will be hard. If it's evangelism, we, we all know it will be hard. It's hard work, you know, preparing the way. So the call, prophet in the wilderness, calls us to hard work. 
Third point, we go back to verse 2. Uh, the, I suppose one of the central points of the whole ministry of John the Baptist, uh, the whole introduction to, to making way for the king to receive in Jesus, repent for the kingdom of, of heaven is at hand. It's, it's coming, it's within your reach, it's here. Rep First thing you need to do is to repent. Cannot receive Jesus uh, unless we renounce our sin, that we repent, that we turn our lives round. First stage of salvation. But for those of us that uh, maybe made that commitment to the Lord many years ago, we can perhaps sort of pass on quite quickly at this point. We all accept it, we, uh, but you know, it's, it's something that's perhaps passed in a way for us. Repentance is an ongoing thing as well. It's about having a submissive spirit uh, to the Lord, to allowing the Holy Spirit to shape our lives, to be teachable, that we go on and on learning his ways, growing closer to his heart. For those crowds that came, that would come, they were, came to, to John the Baptist. They, um, they were waiting for the coming kingdom. They were waiting for the age to come. They were waiting for the Messiah. It was the, and uh, words soon got round. It was the big question going around. You know, is this this prophet? Is this um, the Elijah that was prophesied uh, by Malachi that would precede the Messiah? And they came and they, they were baptised. And they, they, they uh, repented. But how far did it go? Certainly for the Pharisees, we know, for, or for most of them, I, I like to think there were people like Nicodemus who were here uh, that had, did have an ongoing relationship with the Lord and were faithful in the end. But for most of them, we know for the Pharisees, they did not have a submissive spirit. They had a, a very preconceived idea of what this Messiah was going to be and what he was going to say to them. And they were not teachable. They, they, they couldn't be changed. They couldn't be shaped uh, by the Lord's word. For us, is the, is the disappointment, is there, with a, is there just a, a sense of our labouring for so long that we become, have preconceived ideas? Uh, you know, we're no longer teachable. We're, our, our hearts are no longer submissive. Uh, you know, somehow we've heard it all before. We know the answers. Uh, you know, the Lord hasn't got anything new for us. So there is a challenge there for us. You know, this sense of ongoing, uh, a willingness, uh, not just initially to, to repent and uh, for reversal and for change, but a willingness to, to listen and to be teachable and guided by the Holy Spirit in all that we do. Fourth point going on to verse 5. Uh, spirit in the wilderness uh, does not go unnoticed. Uh, uh, prophet in the wilderness, sorry, does not go unnoticed. Uh, as I've already said, uh, John the Baptist was the big talking point uh, around, you know, is this the, the Elijah? Is this a prophet? Is this the Messiah? Uh, John's Gospel fills us in, John's Gospel uh, chapter 1, I think about starting verse 19, tells us a bit more about this, about what the, the scribes and the Pharisees were asking. And, uh, you know, they were asking Jesus, uh, John all these questions, to which he replied, No, I'm none of these things. I am a messenger. I am a herald. And I'm just uh, pointing towards the Messiah that he who's come. He's coming. Well, we may not draw the crowds like uh, John the Baptist, but ministry, no genuine ministry goes unnoticed. Jesus said, you know, he who gives a cup of cold water in my name will not lose his reward, their reward. 
Uh, in 1 Peter chapter 2, Peter uh, calls us, uh, or, you know, to have an honourable conduct amongst the Gentiles. That though they speak against you as evildoers, by your works they will praise God in the day of his, his visitation. No, although effectively they are rejecting you, they are denying you. No, it does not go unnoticed. A genuine faith, a genuine witness to the Lord does not go unnoticed or unrewarded. Profit in the wilderness uh, does not go unnoticed. Uh, just the next three points in, in uh, just a headline. Uh, we haven't got time to look at them and their big subjects and subjects you're familiar with. But prophet in the wilderness calls us to baptism. Prophet in the wilderness calls us to bear fruit. Of course, that's a, uh, really a John chapter 15 subject. Uh, and prophet in the wilderness warns of judgment to come. And, but to go on uh, really to verse 11... The big, big thing of where the, the whole message is going is a prophet in the wilderness points us towards Jesus and esteems him above everything. As we're, we're brought to the core message, core message of, of perhaps any, <laughs> any Bible exposition. John has made it perfectly clear you know, that he, he is, is nothing. You know, his baptism cannot save anybody. He cannot save them. The one that is coming, the Messiah can. He's also warned the Pharisees that, you know, that no claim they can make makes them uh, preferential. You know, do not say that you are the children of Abraham. No, God can raise up the children of Abraham out of these stones. No. Uh, we don't come with any anything that we can offer that can, we cannot save people. Nothing that we can offer uh, of ourselves can, can save them. No uh, ideas of uh, you know worldly greatness or influence can sa we can save them, or delusions of self-importance. But what we can do, if Jesus is our Lord, our Saviour, we know his wonderful salvation, we know his love upon our lives, we know his guidance in our daily living, is point people towards him and esteem him. That is my Saviour, that is my Lord, that is whom I follow, that is who can save you. That's effectively where John the Baptist's ministry was headed. He was preparing the groundwork. He was a, he was a messenger. He'd uh, challenged people about their sin. He brought them to baptism. But he couldn't save them. The coming Messiah could. And the coming Messiah uh, would uh, sort out uh, the wheat from the chaff. He would uh, draw out those who were true to him. Draw them to salvation and reject what was false. Great word of encouragement there. Great, great thing that, uh, you know, we are not burdened by, <laughs> you know, we, we need to somehow try and do something to save people. We cannot do that. That's the Holy Spirit's job, and that's, we can point them towards Jesus, and uh, that is all we can do, as John the Baptist did. Really, uh, in a way, the passage closes there. Uh, we, we hand over to Jesus, really, from then on. But I have one final point. Uh, you know, I don't know whether I should leave it there or not, but uh, it's not quite the end of John the Baptist's story. I'm sure you all know what happened to him and why. 
read about that in uh, Matthew chapter 14. But he was beheaded by, by Herod because he spoke out and spoke out against immorality. Um, anybody that is serious about being faithful and being true to the Lord in these days or any time for that matter needs to ponder upon that we also perhaps need to ask the question why is it in places like China or Iran the church is growing so fast and why is it dying here I wonder amongst really the confusion and the, dis, uh, the division and the mess that the established church is in. Whether the elephant in the room is this, the thing that nobody dares to say, well, we don't want to end up like John the Baptist. We can say, well, well you know, we're not actually called to be a prophet. That's a bit different. That's not my ministry. But Jesus made it pretty clear. What they did to me, they'll do to you. Our lives, our futures, we all know, lie within his care, not within the world's power. We're, we're within his grace, within his plan. But not all the reformers were burnt at the stake, but an awful lot were. Profit in the wilderness causes to a simple lifestyle. Profit in the wilderness causes to hard work. Profit in the wilderness causes to repentance. Profit in the wilderness does not go unnoticed. Profit in the wilderness causes to baptism. Profit in the wilderness causes to bear fruit. Profit in the wilderness warns us of the judgment which is to come. Prophet in the wilderness, above everything, points us towards Jesus and esteems him. Prophet in the wilderness is a short-lived ministry.